Right, welcome back. Uh, let's pick up from where we stop. Uh, the next one is the arm of the Lord revealed. Isaiah 53 in verse 1. Who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now, what a way to you know just point to the crucifixion and on the cross. Isaiah is referring to a prophetic message which he is about to deliver about the cross. Now, people will find it hard to believe, yet uh, this message will show and reveal the arm of the Lord or you know the power of God. So that verse says, who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Meaning, to whom is the power of God being revealed to? Now, Paul writes, right? He says, uh, in Romans 1.16, he says, the gospel is the power of God. And 1 Corinthians, he says that the cross is both the wisdom and the power of God. So we talked about this last semester as well. The arm of the Lord, the power of God, the power of the gospel. Uh, to whom is it revealed? To everyone. But for some of them, they will not believe it. For some of them, it is foolishness. right? Romans 10, 16. But they have not obeyed, not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? The report here uh, is the gospel that is being preached. Right? So here's the wonderful part. The arm of the Lord, you know, in many places in the Old Testament says, the arm of the Lord is not too short to, to heal. The arm of the Lord is not short to deliver, to redeem. So when, whenever it's described the arm of the Lord, it only describes the power of God. Right? So for example, it's, you know, we say, uh, a, a person who uh, has gone away from God, right? Thing, uh, you know, doing all the wrong things, living a sinful life. You know, in in this biblical language, we can say, "Hey, the arm of the Lord is not too short to heal this person," right? So it only talks about the power of God. Uh, there's a verse here. Right, kings. Okay, Nina is asking. Kings will stand in amazement. That is to happen. Okay, so Nina, to answer your question, in in the Old Testament, we right now we don't have kings. So kings now means leaders, people in high positions, and uh, people in probably in government rule and uh, higher positions. So it's it's not only talking about now; it's 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 called a prefiguring, right? So it's it's both for now and for later, right? Uh, is is a prophetic prefiguring. So it's talking about now. Even now, people will stand in amazement of Jesus. If they don't stand now, later they will have to stand in amazement of Jesus. So yes, uh, it's it's happening now. It will, if it's not happening now, of course, we know many people in high positions who believe in Jesus, believe in the cross, uh, believe in what he has done. Uh, but there's also many of them who don't believe. Right. So every king, meaning every ruler, Every person in high positions will stand in amazement. Now, this amazement, uh, the word amazement can be in awe and wonder, or it can also be in fear and trembling. Right? So it's it's a picture of both, right? Uh, you and I can, when we look at the Lord Jesus, there's going to be awe and wonder and love and beauty. And we just, you know, worship him for he who he is. Revelations four and five, talking about uh, after the rapture, right? Uh, we will we will see him as he is. And Paul also says that, right? We will see the Lord in the rapture. He'll come on the clouds. We will see him as he is. Now, when we see him, it's not like we're going to be fearful. Oh my, oh Jesus, let me go to the back and stand. No, we'll be in a hurry to see Jesus. Why? Because it's a joy. And it's a it's an honor to watch him. But what about people who didn't believe, people who don't believe? It's not going to be a joy and honor. It's going to be fear and trembling. So the word amazement can encompass both these aspects. Uh, Nina, I hope that answers your question. Yes, it means rulers now and later as well. Yes, yes. Right. OK. As a tender plant, a root out of dry ground. Isaiah 53, verse 2, we, we read this already. Uh, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. 
he has no form or comeliness and when we see him there is no beauty that we should desire him right look at this for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant as the lord jesus is growing up he was not uh, saying hey i'm the messiah this is what i am this is what i can do it's nowhere is it mentioned right uh, he, he grew up as a tender plant under watchful care right uh, and i always wonder right imagine if uh, uh, Jesus's parents said, "Okay, anyway, you're Messiah. No, you're, you're the you're the king and you're the God. So you look after yourself." And it never happened, right? They had to look after the child, and as the child was growing up, they had to feed him and teach him. And the Lord Jesus Himself, being God, He had to learn. The Bible says He grew in wisdom. It's not like He was there and now uh, suddenly, when He's twenty years old, full wisdom came upon Him. No. Right? From the time he was eight, we see that he was you know, going to the temple. There was that one account, but probably after that, he went many times. And he spent time in God's word. He spent time in the scriptures. And he began to, he knew that, you know, this is me. This is, uh, this is what God has called me for. The Father's uh, purpose is here. But he grew up as a tender shoot. Even knowing his status, even knowing who he was, he grew up as a tender shoot. Right? Uh, as a tender plant, referring to God's hand of nurture and protection over the Messiah's childhood, right? Uh, a root out of dry ground, meaning coming out of difficult times. Was the Lord Jesus under one rich family? Now, his whole birth itself was a difficult time, right? Mary is pregnant. They're going searching for a place. Firstly, they're running away. Right, so it's not like they can relax wherever they want. They needed to get out of that place quickly, right? And then they go into Bethlehem. Bethlehem, there's no place. And imagine Joseph and Mary. What is happening? Right? What do I do? Right? So many questions, so many thoughts, maybe going into their mind. And it, it was a difficult season, right? Uh, but we see that a, a, a root out of dry ground, meaning coming out of difficult times so if you and i are going through difficult times it doesn't mean that you know god does not love us and we know that right we know that god loves us but god lets us go through these seasons right i'm not saying allow the difficult times to be there It'll be only in difficult times only then we will learn no right there are seasons that god takes us through right? uh, uh, we look at Ecclesiastes 3 and we see, right? God works and sees there's a season to grow, there's a season to harvest, there's a season for crying, laughing, there's a season for everything, right? And here's the verse I was talking to you about. When we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Now, when Jesus, you know, uh, he knew he's the Messiah. He didn't wear a kingly robe and wear those, you know, what the high priests wear, all those uh, 12 tribes and all those things, and then, you know, wear some wonderful sandals and look fully decked up. No. And he was very simple. Just walking around, doing, wearing the clothes that if he was, Jesus was there in this time, he would have worn a jeans, one shoes, and t shirt. Right. At that time it was a tunic and that long robe, so he would have worn that. He came out without any show or pomp. He came with simplicity. Here was the Almighty God coming as man, and he could have come with such greatness. He could have come like lightning in the sky and just come down, and uh, an angel could have come and said, this is the Messiah, and placed the Messiah on the ground. And said, you both look after this baby. There's a Messiah. Did God do that? Did it, did, was it like, you know, the whole of Israel was looking up into the clouds. Oh, man, there's a white horse that is coming. And in that horse, there's, it looks like the, you know, the king is holding a baby or uh, the angels are holding a baby. And that's going to be the Messiah. And they all came ready to bow down before him. No. He was in a cow's stable. Right? There was no pomp. There was no show at all. Yet he came with such simplicity. There was nothing attractive about him. Uh, and because of this, the Jews would stumble. 
Wherever Jesus said, I'm the Messiah, you are. You're the Messiah. You're the carpenter's son. You look at you, how you are. You are wearing these clothes like this. You know, you, you don't look like a Messiah. Now the point is, Jesus came in such simplicity that the Jews, it was a stumbling block. Now the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees would have said, Oh, I look better than you. Look at me, I've worn the robe. Uh, the high priest, they, they have certain clothes. There's a way to portray yourself. You can't be walking around like this. Right? So they stumbled at it. Uh, his own brother said, uh, uh, you know, I grew up in with brothers in my house. I know how it is. His brothers would have said, what's wrong with this guy? Huh? He's going on and on saying, you know, I'm the Messiah, going on reading that scriptures. What is he doing? Right? In one verse, he says, you go. Show yourself. You're saying, no, you're Messiah. You go. Don't be here. Don't be keep telling us at home. There's no use. Go tell people outside that you're the Messiah. Right? Before the Feast of the Tabernacles, they said, go. His own brother said, oh, he's a little off. Because there was nothing in him, nothing to, when we look at him, there was nothing great in him. Right? It's just a simple man. Till 30 years old, he was probably cutting that wood, carrying wood to places. Doing that wood business. Right? And in, in the book of Mark, it says, Hey, we know you, yeah. You're saying Messiah, we know you. We've seen you walking around here. We've seen you, you know, with your brothers and your sisters and all of that. We know your mother. You can't be the Messiah. Why? It's too simple. But he was the Messiah. Right? This caused the Jews to stumble because in their mind, even now, when you talk to Jews, you ask them about the Messiah. Right? If you if you talk to a true Jewish person, now when we see a lot of Jews, you know, they are like uh, all modern Jews, right? But you talk to a uh, if you go to Israel, you catch one of those Pharisees or those uh, uh, you'll find them around there. They'll be wearing the full robe, and you know they'll also have those, uh, you know, everything the uh, the precious stones, everything. They'll be they'll have that uh, scriptures always, you know, that they would have tied a uh, tunic here, and they would have put the scriptures there always to you. You ask them, and, uh, what, what do you think about the Messiah? And you know what they'll say? I believe the Messiah is going to come on the clouds. And when he comes on the clouds, there'll be such greatness. He'll come with the angels and uh, the host of angels. They will come and he will come to Jerusalem and he will stay in Jerusalem. And they're still waiting for it. Now here, Jesus has come. The Messiah has come, done everything, did everything. The cross is finished. He's resurrected, gone back to him. They are still waiting for the first coming. We are waiting for the second coming. Now you see the picture here. Why they are waiting for the same? You talk to them about, hey, but Jesus came. No, he died on the cross. No, no, no. He's a prophet. He's a prophet. How can a Messiah, how can the Messiah die on the cross? But you go to Isaiah 53. You tell them. They will not talk about Isaiah 53. 52, 53, 54. They will not talk about it. No, that is somebody else, they'll say. Why? Because they're not able to Accept the fact that Jesus, being a carpenter's son, came in such humility, died on the cross, like a murderer, right? Like a like a criminal, he died. So for the Jews, it is. Don't tell me this. It, it cannot be. We are still waiting for him to come on the clouds. Right? We are still waiting for him to come in great glory. And when he comes, we'll know he's a Messiah. You talk to any Jew now, they will say that. I'm talking about really Jews who really believe in the Old Testament. They're following the law, all of that. Right? Why? Because it was too much for them to accept the fact. But it's already done. Of course, uh, God through the Holy Spirit has you know, touched many lives. Many Jews have accepted Jesus as their personal savior. And uh, it's wonderful, right? Look at 
the apostle Paul himself, right? Well, trained under Gamaliel, he knew everything about the law. Who is this Jesus guy saying Christianity and Christians and all of it? Doesn't make sense to me. Let's wipe out that religion. And he had the encounter, right? So it was it was too much. And even now it's too much for people to understand because he was so tender, he was so simple, no pomp, no show. Uh, and that was a fulfillment of prophecy. John 1, 45 and 46, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Check, see what Nathanael says. And Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Right. Nazareth. Uh, <laughs> now it's like saying, you know, uh, Philip is fully excited. Hey, we found the Messiah. Right? And he's coming to Nathan. Nathan is saying, Nazareth. Why Nazareth out of all the places? Nothing is good in Nazareth. But Philip says, come and see. Right? So, the Philippians 2, 5 through 9, I love this verse. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a born servant, coming in the likeness of man, being found in the appearance of, as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God also has exalted him and given him the name which is above every other name. Here you and I are challenged to be like Jesus. Right? God gives us gifts, God gives us talents, God gives us abilities. But we are never to use them in a way saying that I know everything. It's wonderful that God gives us all of this. Let this mind which in be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being the God, did not consider it equal robbery to be equal with God. Sometimes we consider, no, when people say, "Hey, uh, you know, we'll not give you this opportunity now, or we'll give it to you next time." We get angry, we get upset. We don't have to do that. Why? Because when you look at what Jesus did, he made himself of no reputation. Right? Could could Jesus have said? No, of course he did these powerful miracles and you know raising the dead, opening blind eyes, lepers being healed. He did all these wonderful miracles, but nowhere do we see him boasting about those miracles. Do we see him boasting? And here's another wonderful thing, you know. I, I, I was reading uh, the gospel, suddenly it struck me. Jesus does not ponder on everything that was done before, he's always looking ahead, you know. He doesn't say, hey, I raised up Lazarus. I, I opened his blind eyes. Then I met this person. I met this person. Nothing. Right? Uh, it was all about doing more, looking forward. And that's the mind that you and I should have. Yes, God gives us victories. We look back. We thank God for the opportunities. There are times we, are, we have done well. There are times we may have failed. And we have learned from those mistakes. Yes, we look back, but we always press on forward. Right. Remember what the Apostle Paul says? I press on to see what God has in store for me. Right. So always remember, stay humble. Right. Stay humble. Uh, and especially, you know, when you get opportunities uh, uh, to immediately be on the stage, stay humble. Because it's very easy for pride to come in. Very easy. Now I'm I'm saying this because. I had to keep a check on my life, right? So at a very young age, I got opportunities. Go, go, Paul, you lead worship. Go, Paul, you preach, right? As a young age, go, Paul, you do this. Go, you do this. And so I got all these opportunities. And sometimes pride can creep in, right? But here, Always go back to this. God 
the Lord Jesus, being God himself, came down and he made himself of no reputation. He even chose to be uh, born in such a humble way. He chose to be born out of a carpenter's son. He chose to do the menial work. He chose simple fishermen and tax collectors, simple people. And with that humility, he did great things. Right? And that's a lesson for us. It's wonderful when God gives us opportunities, but always our, you know, yesterday we were praying in our evening prayer. Everything that we do should be out of that intimacy with God. We were praying for re revival, refreshing. Why? Because at times we are doing the same thing again and again and again. It becomes a routine. But when the rain of his presence comes, there's a revival. There's a, all that dryness goes away, right? So it's wonderful, right? I'm not saying don't do what you're doing. You're writing songs, coming up with songs, wonderful. But keep a check on your heart. Keep a check on your heart because that is very, very important. Because the moment you see pride coming in, when you see, hey, I can do it, uh, you know, or I, I can do it without anybody's help. I'll do it on my own. Keep a check on that, right? Uh, keep your heart humble. Stay grounded. Now, one of the things that uh, we as a team always do is we always focus on, you know, when we are leading worship, preaching, uh, it's it's ministry unto the Lord, right? Of course, we are uh, we have people, we are ministering to people, but the true ministry happens out of that intimacy. So this is ministry out of the Lord, right? That is coming out. Right? So especially, you know, in times of, you know, if you're rostered to lead worship, I say this many times, and I always talk to worship leaders, and I tell them, right? It's very easy to lead for one hour. Yes, right? very easy. Choose one, five songs. In between, say Hallelujah, Hosanna. It'll finish, right? And nobody will know. Oh, hey, nice worship. But God knows. Right? God knows how much time we have spent in His presence, and sometimes it will. That intimacy with God will reflect outside. People will be blessed. People will, it's like a fire that will spread, no? It's the anointing. That's when people are truly blessed. Sometimes people are, you know, they just enjoy the music. Hey, this is a wrong chord. That is, that means they've enjoyed the music. But it's about, you know, blessing, being a, the ministry should be a blessing to people. That should be our motive. Right? So as you as you guys write songs, even those online students, as you write songs or preparing messages, preparing sermons, God gives you opportunities to reach out. Be willing to do even the menial tasks, especially when you grow up the ladder. No, it's very hard to do menial tasks. But what did Jesus do in the prime of his ministry? Prime. Everyone would think, hey, Jesus is wonderful. He's thousands of people following him in the prime of his ministry he made his disciples sit and he washed everyone's feet and he said if you want to be a leader you first choose to be a servant right so walking in humility there's power in that right? sometimes we feel oh so you know everyone are getting opportunity because i'm walking humbly no opportunity for me no there is power in humility god will know how to open the right door for you Right, so uh, when you and I are doing our ministry, let's do it in humility. Right, uh, don't take offenses. Don't, you know, oh, everyone should recognize me. Everyone should applaud me. Leave all that to God. Right, it's nice. We feel nice, you know, when people say, "Hey, good job, you've done well." It's nice. Uh, but one of the things that we, as a as as a leader, always says, don't accept. Flattery. Don't give it, don't take it. No, it's flattery. What is flattery? Oh, Pastor, what a worship. Such a wonderful worship. I went to heaven and almost reached third heaven. Then I came back. Oh, the voice also, Pastor. So nice. The guitaring also, the keyboard. And then you're standing there and say, Oh, man. Yes, I am the. I've done it. <laughs> yeah. 
So one of the things I do is people will say, in my mind, I'm shutting off my ears. OK, praise God, leave it. So there will be people who will come up and say, but you, you don't take that flattery and keep becoming a balloon. Right? I always use that example. You keep blowing the balloon. Suddenly, one fellow will say, Hey, you didn't play that song properly. Hot, gone, bursted. Oh, I didn't play properly. You start crying, you start weeping. All that won't matter. Why? Because, hey, you're normal. I didn't play. Okay, next time I'll play. It doesn't mean that God is saying out of worship ministry. <laughs> No, right? It doesn't work that way, right? It's all about how we take it, right? Of course, you take correction, you take feedback from people, and you work on it. You know, I remember when I was leading worship, I used to go back to my recordings. So listen to my recordings. Why am I doing this? I used to wonder. You know, I, I had this habit of, you know, always moving. Like, you know, the mic is <laughs> keep moving. Then I kept looking at my recording. Hey, why am I moving? I need to stand in one place. It's a simple thing, but it's. It, but it's an important thing, right? Then I also uh, realized that, you know, one time I had these notes and I was leading, all the notes fell off somewhere. So I'm leading and looking at the pa papers fallen down. I stopped. I, took, I don't know if those recordings are there. This is 2012 13 at Central, right? The, and the papers have fallen off. I've stopped. Luckily, there was a ban, no? so I stopped taking the papers. In. So all these things are there. Uh, there are times things went well. So all of this should you know, help us to learn. It shouldn't be a, a, a place where, hey, I'm the best. I can do all things. Yeah, you can do all things through Christ, but there's a way to do it. Right? right? So that's that's very important. OK, a man of sorrows and grief, Isaiah 53.3, he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Despised, the way the Roman soldiers treated Jesus, and the way the Jewish leaders also treated Jesus, they despised him, they mocked him, they ridiculed him. They rejected, abandoned, and left him alone. Even his closest disciples left him. John 1, 10, 11, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. I'm always fascinated by that verse. You know, there's a song. Uh, Mary, did you know that your baby boy is uh, will someday walk on water? Mary, did you know? That your baby boy will save our sons and daughters. I don't think she knew. <laughs> right? She said, okay, Messiah. Like for her, it, she knew that you know this is going to happen, but I'm sure she never pictured this kind of death. Like maybe some soldier came and oh and die. She maybe she never pictured this kind of death. This is the worst form of death. That a man of sorrows, a man of grief, uh, people made fun of him, that his own friends, his own family, his own brothers made fun of him, ridiculed and mocked. Uh, and is it is it fun to be ridiculed and rejected and mocked? Oh, but he took it up for us. Right? The Lord Jesus became a man who suffered a lot of pain and sicknesses. Uh, uh, now, it, it's not necessary that his whole life he suffered pain and sicknesses. It was mostly on the cross where that pain, a, a combination of the physical pain and the pain of being away from the Father. Right? Uh, Isaiah presented this aspect of Christ's work. He bore this so that we do not need to bear it. He bore our griefs. He carried our sorrows. Uh, I like that uh, other verse, Isaiah 53, 4. It says, Surely our griefs, and he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. The Lord Jesus carried away our sins, our pain. Uh, and when we think of this, it is 
it's such a humbling thing, right? Uh, every time I tell myself, I thank God for the opportunities He gives us. No, I always thought, man, God, if I was only in ministry, you no, know, I will do this, 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 this. Uh, when I was working in the corporate sector, I want to do so much. Uh, why? Because you've done so much for me. So I want to do so much more for you. And this whole feeling was there for a long time. And even now, sometimes I, I, and I, when I look back and I say, God, if you tell me to start again, I don't mind starting again. Uh, and I keep telling you all, no, I don't mind coming and sitting, and just listening to lectures. I don't mind. Uh, it, it's not something that, oh, I finished, I'm a teacher. No, no. It's because when you look at the cross, it should just make us in a place where we feel, hey, Lord, you've done so much for me. How much more I should do for you? Right? How much more I should give everything I have for you? Right? Uh, of course, we are weak in our bodies. We are weak in our... Uh, there are times we are weak in our spirit, our soul. Uh, we go through emotions. But we need to overcome all of that. Right? We need to overcome. I remember last night we went home late. Uh, by the time I went home, the kids were still awake. So by the time we put them to sleep, you know, it's late. It's 12 o'clock, 12 30 by the time I slept. I said, God, tired. And the alarm rings in the early morning. So I'm not able to get up. And today, this morning, I was not able to get up. Like, Man, it's just three hours, three, three and a half hours. But I remember this. Uh, you know, this picture just came. How the Lord Jesus. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was so stirred up in his soul that he could not sleep. All the disciples were sleeping, but he could not sleep. So he went and he prayed and he prayed. Of course, the context is different because he knew what was happening. Uh, the same way I felt, no, I have to do this. Because now when I'm 60 years old, I can't do it. Right? I'm 70 years old, I can't do it. I need to rest. What I'm trying to say is, as, as we are young, right, just give your best for God. Give, do as much as you can when you're young. So when you're old, you can look back and say, hey, done something for God, right? Because Jesus forgave our sins. He healed us. Uh, he could do so because he did it as a prepayment in advance. So whatever Jesus did was a down payment of what in his earthly ministry, it was a down payment of what he was going to do at the cross. What did Jesus say at Lazarus' tomb? I am the resurrection and I am the life. They all say, oh, they're all weeping. Jesus says, hey, I'm the resurrection, I'm the life. But was he already dead? Did he rise up again? again? No. He was talking from the position of the cross. Hey, I'm, I'm the resurrection. I'm the life. I'm going to do it later on. But this is a down payment. Lazarus, come out. All the miracles that he did was, he knew that one day, 100% will come for all of them. Now I'm giving 20%. Right? Or I'm giving 50%. Down payment. Because one day the cross will happen. Right? For our peace, Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded... For our transgression, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Wonderful verse, right? Look at Isaiah writing such prophetic, poetic words, uh, yet profound truth, profound truth, that even thousands of years later, even as we are reading this, it brings a tear to our eyes. That Jesus, yet he was wounded for our sins, our rebellion, our trespasses. He was bruised, he was beaten, he was, you know, uh, crushed for our iniquities, which means our evils, our faults, our guilt. The chastisement, the punishment for our peace was upon him. It's all about us. What we should have gone through, everything Jesus did for us. 
we should have been on that cross. We should be taking the pain. We should be going through this suffering. But he did it for us. Right? Imagine, you know, when we get hurt physically or even emotional, sometimes these emotional hurts are more painful than a physical hurt. Physical hurt, okay, we can manage, you know, got hurt, put some medicine, put some crepe band, and it'll be okay. What about emotional hurt? Sometimes these emotional hurts go for years and years and years. You know, brother and brother, brother and sister, or father and son, or father and daughter, and friends, between friends as well. Emotional hurts. They can last for years and years. I know of people who, uh, you know, who don't talk to their brother. And they're 50, 60, or 50 or 60 years old now. The moment you talk about the brother, they get angry. What happened? 25 years back, 25 years back, something happened, some misunderstanding. The parents said this. Uh, so they like uh, that boy. They like him more than me. So I don't want. So 25 years. So from 25 years, you're carrying that anger. And it's true. It, it, there's no, it may not be a physical hurt, but emotionally they're hurt. It could be something very simple. Right? Look at Jacob and Esau. Esau was really angry. Hey, as a first son, I was supposed to get all the blessings. This guy deceived and took all the blessings. And so for many years, they were separated from each other. Esau said, I'm going to kill you. You come, you, I'm going to search you. I'm going to kill you. For many years. I think finally Esau said, OK. I don't want anything of yours. God has blessed me also. Peace treaty. Right? And they were, you know, they became friends again. But there was emotional hurt. Right? Now, when we go through all of this, don't you think that we should, you know, just give it up because of what Jesus did for us? For our peace, for our transgression, uh, for our iniquities, for our evils, for our faults, everything. He took it up. All we need to do is surrender it to him. That's all we need to do. Right? Now, it may sound simple. You may say, hey, Pastor, it sounds simple, but you don't know the hurt that I've gone through. Yes, there is hurt. But the Bible here, what, is, what did the cross do for us? For our iniquities, for our evil, for our faults, for our guilt, for our the, the punishment, for our peace was upon him. The punishment for our peace. Uh, you know, peace is something important, no? Uh, how many of you feel restless in your spirit at times? There's no peace. You know, you can be in a beautiful place. It's calm and serene. But the mind, there's no peace. This especially happens to people who, you know, who are task-oriented. Task one, task two, task three. Right? So you can be... Uh, it happens to me. Right? That's something that I... That I always think of, you know, we'll be sitting in the beach, enjoying the beach, and suddenly my mind is thinking, okay, I have to call this person. Then he said he has to set up the sound system. Uh, then in the church, there's this other couple. Why they didn't come to church? Uh, maybe I need to call them. And then I'm thinking of all kinds of things. Right now, they may be good things, but the mind is continually thinking of things. Sometimes that can end up in. Un rest, a restless feeling inside in our heart, in our mind. The peace of God is so important for all of us. It passes all understanding. Right? And it says here, we don't have to live in, you know, many times I've shared with these people, you know, who are angry with their own brother, own sister. They've not been talking to them for years. Spoken to them. This is what the Bible says. You can just give it up to Jesus. It's not easy for them. Why? Because it's years of guilt. But if we do it, the Lord is willing to. He's saying, all he's saying here is, by his stripes we are healed. That healing can be both physical and emotional. Right? Shalom is total well-being. And it and we know that the word shalom is encompasses many many aspects. Let's read uh, Exodus 15:20 through 2 to 26. It talks about Jesus 
the tree who turns a bitter into sweet. Exodus 15, 22 to 26. Yes, go ahead. Anyone can read. Exodus chapter 15, uh, reading from verse 22. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they turned they, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. When they came to Mara, they could not drink it, its water because it was bitter. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What we are to drink? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made a decree and a law for them, and, and there he tasted them. Yeah. So this, again, is talking about, uh, this is just a digression from Isaiah, what we've been talking on. Uh, Isaiah, uh, Exodus 15, 22 to 26, the people have come out of Egypt. They are drinking this water in the uh, Mariah. And what's happened? It's bitter. The water is bitter. No, how uh, can we drink bitter water? It's bitter. Oh, Moses, why did you bring us out as usual? They started grumbling. Why did you bring us out? There's no water here. So God told Moses, take that piece of wood, throw it into the river. They threw it, he threw it, and then they tasted the water and became sweet. Now that is a type of Jesus, right? The Jesus, the one, the true one who turns our bitter into sweet. This is where the Lord revealed himself as Jehovah Rapha and the Lord who turns our sickness into wholeness. And again, if we read the whole of Exodus, there are many places where Christ is portrayed. Uh, but looking ahead to the cross, Isaiah said, we are healed. Now looking back, Peter says, by his stripes we were healed. Right? It's very clear that uh, Peter is talking uh, is speaking of physical healing, and he uses this Greek word "iomai," which is cure and made whole. And and then there are plenty of places here, all in the book of, uh, uh, in from Matthew to, uh, uh, from the early church, we see, you know, the Roman centurion servant, woman with the issue of bleeding, multitudes who touched Jesus who were healed, the man with leprosy, the ten lepers. Uh, the man at the pool of Bethsaida, the cripple, cripple man at the temple gate. Uh, so all of these wonderful miracles that happened uh, were talking about the physical healing. By his stripes, we were healed. Right. So, so these are, you know, there's so much more that we we'll pick up from next week. But these are some of the things that are available for us through the cross. Right. So even as you and I, as believers, we spend time in worship, we spend time in the word, meditating, reading God's word, spending time in his presence, um, always keep the cross before you. Right? Uh, it's a picture. Let the cross be a place where you say, OK, this is what I'm doing, and this is why I'm doing it, because of the sacrifice of the cross. Right? Now, we don't have to sit and only think about the cross and cry the whole day. No. right? We know that Jesus is resurrected. He is here. But the entire world, Christianity, right, is based on the cross. Right? It's not based on miracles. Christianity is not based on uh, you know, the missionary journeys. No. It's based on that cross. Right? So picture you're all coming together to worship the Lord, let the cross be the center. Right? So there is healing, there is deliverance, there's peace, there's joy, there's everything at the cross. And when you have that picture, our worship becomes real. And when I say worship, it's not only about the songs that we sing, but our life itself becomes a worship. Right? Our, our, our speech, uh, the way we talk, the way we uh, say things, the way we uh, you know, communicate with people. Everything is based out of that identity. Right? What does Second Corinthians five seventeen says? Anyone is in Christ; he is a new creation. Right. So 
I just want to encourage us, you know, even as we pray and seek the Lord, let the cross be the center of everything that we do. Okay, uh, Nina is asking a question. Under the heading, A Man of Sorrows and Grief, the notes say he suffered pain and sickness. The pain, yes. The sickness relates to, yeah. So uh, the pain and sickness, he suffered on our behalf. So we know that the, the cross was a place where he took, he bore our pain, he bore our sicknesses. So if you look at the verse after that, uh, uh, Just a moment, you know. Yeah, fifty-three five. But he was wounded; he was bruised for our iniquities. Uh, this is on uh, a man of sorrows, right? Oh, let me just see. Yeah. Which which verse is this you're talking about? Yeah, Isaiah 53, 4. Yeah, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. So, so Nina, to answer your question, uh, it's not his sickness, but it is our sickness, our grief he carried on the cross for us. Uh, so basically, it's a it's this great exchange where you know we was we our sicknesses our pains our guilt our transgression our iniquities everything was put upon him uh, and so now you and i can stand as justified redeemed healed sanctified and all of that so uh, it is ours that he took it up and he took it up willingly for us right is that okay Which page is this, uh, Nina? Uh, you're saying the notes say it. He suffered a lot of sickness. Yeah. So he, the Lord Jesus, became a man who suffered a lot of pain and sickness. Yeah. So so in if you're talking about the natural. Right. If you're talking about the natural, of course, see, we must understand that the Lord Jesus had a physical body also. Right. Uh, but if you look at the cross, right, the cross was a place of pain and the cross was where he took up our sickness. Right. So uh, because we must understand that Jesus became a man. Right. As a man, uh, there were limitations. Right? He he felt sleepy, he felt tired, he was tempted in every way. So Lord Jesus became a man who suffered a lot of pain and sicknesses. It's, it's, it's not saying that every time, wherever he was, he had pain and sickness and all of that. Right Now, for example, Jesus walked from Judea to Jerusalem. Right? Do you think he would have had leg like, pain? Or no, you would have had leg like pain, no. So, you know, so when we take it, we must take it into context, right? Now, the cross is talking about our pains, our afflictions, but as a human being, he went through certain things, right? Now, um, you know, he was when he went to Samaria, he was tired, he was thirsty, he was sitting. He said, "Give me some water." So that talks about the his his humanity there. Um, Oh, so yes, uh, there there would have been, you know, things that he went through that you were. Do you think Jesus would have got fever? And, uh, so so the the point we're trying to bring out is not his humanity side where the natural things would have happened, uh, but the point we're trying to bring out is the cross, where he bore our sickness, he took up our sickness, right? Okay. So let's just close in prayer. And Father, we want to thank you for this time. We thank you for the cross. We thank you so much for what you've done for us, Lord. And even as we continue to serve you and minister to each other, Lord, I pray that the cross will be the center, that we will look to you. And everything that we do, Lord, let it be pleasing and honorable in your sight, oh God. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your scriptures that teach us, oh God. And we pray that we will uh, stay focused and know that 
you took up everything for us on the cross and we can stand here as your children sanctified and blessed in your presence oh god we thank you and we praise you in jesus name we pray amen 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 thank you everyone have a great week ahead i'll see you next week god bless god bless